Another guy that I think deserves some credit for the fact that the Rams have been able to pull off this balancing act where they've got high-priced starters that chew up a lot of the cap, so they're backfilled when needed yeah. with guys who are young and inexperienced and maybe not nearly as good as they need to be. Reggie Scott, the trainer, because we don't have that rash of injuries. No doubt. Where down goes this guy, down goes that guy, down goes that guy. Oh, crap, the Rams are dealing with what we see so many other teams deal with. And I always have that that little blip ready to land on a radar screen when a team has too many injuries. Is it bad luck or is there something going on? Yes, right. With flexibility, strength, right. their techniques, their diet, whatever, because we see it all the time. Guys get pretzeled up in all sorts of weird formations of their bodies and they pop right up and they're fine. And it's amazing when you see it happen. But at some level, that is a product of sound, cutting edge, effective strength, nutrition, flexibility, training of those players. A hundred percent. I think that's really one of the keys to their football team. And that's where, you know, you're, you're saying it right. The training staff, the weight room, the weight staff, that group there, you know, and then I think their correlation or talk with McVay, again, the communication we talk about a lot with the Rams, I think is kind of special there to where, yes, they seem to, when they do have injured players, you know, they don't rush them back. They seem to always kind of find the right way to get them back on the football field. And there's obviously a way with veteran star players that you're kind of thin where they have found that right way. Hey, like like the day, hey, I'll, I'll tell you a day, that two weeks before the Super Bowl, I'm there. And, you know, they hadn't practiced yet. It was a Tuesday, right? Two weeks before the Super Bowl. You know, that day there, they came in for some meetings and the day was going to be about get a legit like weight workout in. We're going to like really lift some weights and get some sweat going and build some muscle up here in our week off. And then the next day they were going to come in and not work out and have quick meetings, but just go out on the field and kind of have a walkthrough and throw some balls to the receivers and do that. So that's to me the magic of the Rams and McVay and having that feel for what the players need and want to be successful. And at the other end of the spectrum, I think back to 2018, Hard Knocks, Cleveland Browns, one of the more compelling scenes that we have witnessed from that series, because really most of the best scenes end up on the cutting room floor because the teams recognize probably not the best idea <laughs> yeah, to let the right. world see this. Right. It was Hugh Jackson and Todd Haley in this dysfunctional debate where Hugh Jackson eventually had to play the I'm the head coach, it's my bus, I drive the bus card on how extensively they were going to use right. their veteran players in training camp. Were they give, going to give them time off? Were you going to get them ready? What do you do? How do you strike that balance? And just the fact that it turned into a debate on the fly in the meeting room, that's stuff that you figure out before you even get to camp. 100%. That's stuff that's baked into how you run your team. You're not having those debates, or at least the functional programs should not be having those debates during training camp coaching meetings. You already know. You have it planned, and there's a quality of deference to the coach that isn't dictated. It's earned. Exactly. The coach sets the agenda. Yes. The agenda works, and everybody else goes along with it. Because it works. Because he and showed us it works. Group. Right. That's right. And you've hired a group of people who understand you got to defer to the coach. And you don't have that crap go on that is so reflective of why the team has been. I mean, we've had some recent examples, one that's still ongoing that we'll talk about later, about why the Browns are so damn dysfunctional and they can't get out of their own way. But that was a prime example of why this team was 1 in 16, 0 in 17, whatever the. Yeah, 1 in 15, 0 in 16. I'm already screwed up with the 17th game. But when you see that and you compare it to the Rams, the Rams don't have those issues. The Rams know exactly what they're going to do. They have a plan. Everybody's on the same page. And there is so much value in that. You don't think about that. You think about what you see on TV I when know. you watch the game. Right. Having everybody on the same page with a plan that works, that is implemented seamlessly, it's the do-your-job mindset. But there isn't that dictatorial component exactly. that Bill Belichick has. Right. And right. it works. Bottom line is it works. Bottom line is it works. Bottom line is it's detailed. You know, you know, maybe not everything like New England or whatever, but it's detailed for sure. You know, you're right. There is one voice. They all buy in. 
to the guy McVay. They know that it's a you know tried and true system, and and the way things are done there that are special. And he's got a coaching staff that understands that too. Yes, I mean I I think and then there's also the connection there of where I think this is where really the the teams on the next level all have it, and that's hey Patriots, Ravens, uh, uh, of course the Rams, the 49ers, the Buccaneers got it right now for sure. Where I feel like the Kansas City Chiefs, where I feel like there's no. Uh, Buffalo Bills, I, I know I'm leaving a few teams out, but everybody's getting the point here. Teams where there's no, we don't feel like, you don't know, you don't feel like there's a civil war in the building by any stretch of the imagination. And you feel like the front office and the coaching staff are on the same page and uh, there's a plan and they understand the communication that it takes to, oh, wait, we got to address this position or what do you like at this position? What kind of player are you looking for so I can study and, and show you a bunch of guys just like that? That to me is why, you know, some of these teams that we continue to talk about on a yearly basis are who they are because of the things you're discussing and, and I think the connection throughout the organization. At the core, a spirit of cooperation – the lack of that basic dysfunction, a coach and a GM who are joined at the hip, not ready to blame the other guy for everything right. that goes wrong. There's always going to be some adversity. The Rams had a three-game losing streak sure. at one point last the year. The Titans right and Rabel and A.J. Right, Brown they, and all they, that. They went in and kicked their ass on a Sunday night, that, yeah. right? And then they, right. they had that, that game against the 49ers in Odell Beckham's debut that was kind of clunky. Yes, and, right. And, and, and you know, it, it – it, and so when that happens, it's all the more important to have everybody on the same page. We're yeah. sticking to our plan, and it will all work out. Because there are some teams out there, when you have that three-game losing streak, they fall apart because you got people saying, "God, you know what? <sighs> you know, the general manager. I mean, yeah, right. Or right, or, right. or the general manager whispering into the yeah, ear of the, co exactly. of the owner, right? That the coach, the coach keeps screwing up, exactly, right? Because right. everybody's trying to stake out territory for when the crap hits the fan, right? And so. I'm staying, he goes, because it's his fault, not mine. You don't have that with the best teams. And that's why there are people in the league, and we've talked about this before, I believe, who are convinced there are only 10 teams at any given time you have to worry about. Yeah, right. The others are just there. Right. That, there are 10 teams, yeah. and, and it changes. It yeah. changes, and there are, there are teams that enter and teams that exit, but there are a nucleus of teams that know what the hell they're doing, and everybody else is just acting like they know what they're doing. Uh, agreed. Agreed. And, and also, I think added on, to on top of that, of the knowledge and actually know what they're doing, I think the other phase of that, and we've discussed this too, is there's only a few teams to me that really all at the end of the day, you know, push it all in the middle of the pile and go, we're going for it. This year, everything, here we go, we expect Super Bowl. Uh, you discuss this a lot and you bring it up, but I think it's very true. I think, you know, not, not all teams do that. I think they might put a, a big portion of the pile in and they go, playoffs will be good, but wait, I don't know if we're going to push that other part in there that could make us a hair vulnerable, but we're going for it. Uh, I think those are few and far between. And I think, you know, the teams we're discussing are the ones that are kind of all in right now because, yeah, they they have all the pieces of the formula and then, of course, the players to match it to be able to go, all right, let's do it. Let's make that extra move or let's do this right here because the time is now. They all say they want to win the Super Bowl every year. A handful can say it truthfully. The rest are just trying to get you to renew your season tickets. <laughs> I mean, it's that simple. And all they want to do is contend into December. Let's stay in contention. That's why there was no pushback from anyone. When they expanded the playoff field to 14, nobody complained at all because you stay in contention even longer when there are more seats at the postseason table. Remember, we were at the scouting combine that year, and yeah. we were asking the coaches about it, and they all – Loved they were all it. in they favor. All we were all like, supported. why? I mean, why? I mean, yes. Yeah, that's the ultimate litmus test. Yeah. Did you make the playoffs to determine whether or not your job is safe? Not many coaches who make the playoffs get fired. It's happened, but not many do because that's your pass fail. Did you make the playoffs? Well, the more playoff spots available, then I got a better chance to save my job. And those are just some of the organizational and human issues that drive these teams. And there are some teams that have it figured out, and most teams, frankly, do not. And that's what makes it hard for the fans of those teams, because until you get a new owner, it's not going to change. And look, look, the Broncos fans have to be thrilled. Now, they don't know what they're going to get. 
I know I'm deviating, but I will get back to the point here. But I just want to say this. The Broncos fans have been dealing with, since winning Super Bowl 50, which I think is the aberration, because it was Peyton Manning fueled. Once Peyton Manning was gone, look where they were. Why were they there? They haven't had an owner. John Elway managed. The best thing he did as the head of football operations in Denver was to get Peyton Manning to come to town. Because once he was there, that was basically like having the owner. You got the sheriff. So as long as he's there, you're going to be good. He's a guy that can make a team move from the category of they don't know what the hell they're doing into consistent contender. Once he's gone, it's been five, six years of they don't know what the hell they're doing because yeah. they didn't have an owner. Now they have a new owner, and we'll see what happens. But that that's where it all starts. That's why I'm making that point. Yeah, so, I think you're you know, right. Say what you will about Stan Kroenke as a man of integrity for what he did to the folks in St. Louis. The guy is willing – to, to cut the checks. Moves, no doubt. The right. guy is willing right. to borrow from his super yacht maintenance fund to take care of his most prized assets on his football team. Not every owner does that, even though there are plenty of other owners that have more than enough money to do it if they wanted to. No, you're right. Not every mo owner can do that. Not every owner, you know, one of the things, I think the things that's a little bit of the dirty little quiet secret of the NFL, a little, is not every owner has the cash on hand to throw out some of these contracts, you know, on a one-year basis, or this money's guaranteed for this year with four other players, and holy crap, we got $110 million guaranteed between three guys this year that I got to pay them cold, hard cash, or the signing bonuses that go with it. That's the other part that, you know, plays into this for sure. But I think you're right, Mike. I mean, it does start with the owner, and I think with some of the teams that we mentioned there and the teams that we talked about that are kind of the mainstays right now in the NFL, I think they all got that in common too. And and you're right. And for the most part, to that and to another point you make, owners that seem to be around, not like always got. Not that they're there every day, but they're hovering around the not, franchise. Not like – Live in Manhattan when their team's in Miami. Exactly. That's that's what I mean. They're around. Not that they're there every day, but they're your pre their presence is felt. You oh, they might walk in today. We don't know. Whatever. To me, there's definitely value in that as well. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.